It's uh, 6.30 in the morning in LA and Vancouver, 9.30 a.m. in New York. Good morning to our colleagues in North America. It's 2.30 p.m. in London, 3.30 p.m. in Europe. Good afternoon to our friends in Europe. It's 7 p.m. in India, 9.30 p.m. in Singapore, Malaysia. Good evening to our colleagues in, in Asia and uh, well past bedtime uh, for our colleagues in Australia. Uh, namaste, uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, I am Anupam Sibyl, I'm the president of GAPIO. I work as a pediatric gastroenterologist and I'm the group medical director of Apollo Hospitals. For those who are joining for the first time, the Global Indian Physicians COVID-19 Collaborative was established on 11th of April to bring together 1.4 million physicians of Indian origin working across the globe on one platform. GAPIO now has members from 50 countries. Well, it's day 285 since the first case of COVID-19 was diagnosed. We know that COVID-19 has been reported from more than 200 countries and territories, 36.4 million cases and counting with more than a million deaths, sadly. Uh, 6 million plus cases in India, 106,000 plus deaths in India. An explosion of knowledge like we've never seen before has taken place. On PubMed, there are 62,082 papers on COVID-19. Uh, that's 218 papers a day, nine papers per hour. And by the time we finish this, we have to go back and read 13.5 papers that we would have missed. Uh, from India, there have been 3,599 publications till today. Today, we'll be discussing the hottest of all the hot topics of COVID-19, and that's the COVID-19 vaccines. I know there is a great deal of anticipation. We as clinicians are asked this question morning, evening, night by family members, relatives, friends, acquaintances, and everyone really that we know. Today, we'll be covering everything we want to know about COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, this is a high-powered program, 90 minutes of knowledge that otherwise would take several days to go through. We have leading experts from across the globe. And to set the ball rolling, let me invite my dear friend, Dr. Professor Santosh Ons for his opening remarks. Uh, Santosh is the Chief Pediatric Intensivist and Neonatologist at the AG Institute of Medical Sciences and Research, Mangalore. He has served as the president of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics and chairman of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics uh, Committee on uh, Immunization. He's the founder president of OM Guild Association of Associations. He's authored five books, has numerous publications, and has been honored with the Outstanding Asia Pacific Pediatrician Award, a National IMA Doctors Award, and the Dr. B.C. Roy Award. Over to you, Santosh. Santosh, please. Thanks, Dr. Anupam, for the kind introduction. Hello, my friends across India and the world. COVID-19 pandemic is by far the greatest disruptor of life in entire human history. The novel coronavirus has immobilized each and every country across the planet. Even the last two world wars would not have caused such a global disruption. True, the loss of life or the limb might have been more heartbreaking in the last two wars. The general misery caused by the past pandemic might have been more. But what COVID-19 has done to de derail our economy and <clears throat> cripple, our mor cripple us morally, it has also exposed many deficiencies in emerging world order. Now all the eyes are on the medical science. The world looks up to us to provide a solution, but we too are completely blindsided even after six to seven months. We have been grouping in the dark, but in recent months, we have had much progress. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Sharing knowledge is very important at this juncture. Today, people look upon the vaccine as a magic pill to make us forget this nightmare. People keep asking us questions regarding their fears and doubts about the COVID and especially about the vaccine. This puts us in a position where we can educate people with the right information and clear their misconceptions. But I find it many of us still are as ignorant as the lay person. I'm glad 
Global Indian Physicians COVID-19 Collaborative has organized this webinar for free exchange of knowledge and latest update on COVID-19 vaccine. I wish to congratulate the organizers led by Dr. Anupam Sibal, internationally renowned pediatric gastroenterologist. Actually, he is a pride of our IAP for this unique initiative. The selection of the topic is very relevant and promising. The speakers are authoritative and who's who in the vaccine world. Uh, hence, I see this webinar as a great opportunity to gain authentic knowledge on COVID, novel coronavirus vaccine and to know where the thing stands today. I wish, wish us all an uh, enlightening and engaging participation in this webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks ever so much, Santosh. We now begin with our first talk and to invite the first speaker and introduce him. Uh, it's a privilege for me to introduce Dr. Nand Kumar Jairam. Uh, Dr. Nand Kumar Jairam is an eminent surgeon. He's the CEO and chairman of Columbia Asia Group of Hospitals. He has served as the chairman of the National Accreditation Board of Hospitals. He's currently the vice president of the Global Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. Over to you, uh, Dr. Nand Kumar Jairam. Thank you, Anupam. I would uh, go straight on to the introduction of uh, Professor Piyush Gupta a renowned academician, teacher, researcher, and author with 30 years standing in child health. He has served as editor-in-chief of Indian Academy uh, of Indian Pediatrics for over six years. He was honored by the National Academy of Medical Sciences, the Royal College of Pediatrics, the UK and American Academy of Pediatrics, and conferred the Teacher of Excellence by the Vice President. He has authored 30 books, 300 chapters and 250 papers have been published by him. He's the president-elect of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, Professor Piyush. Thanks, uh, uh, Professor Nand Kumar, for this uh, uh, introduction. And thanks, Arnupam, for giving this opportunity to be the opening batsman uh, tonight. So uh, I think uh, I'll straight away start with my presentation. I bring greetings to all my esteemed panelists and dear friends. So uh, I'm, I'm sharing the screen. Can uh, just let me know when you can see. We are good. Uh, I can see you, Piyush. Uh, yeah, great. Just, just go on to slideshow, please. Yeah. Perfect. Is it okay? Perfect. So we are talking about to st start the ball rolling. Uh, first, we will start with what should be the ideal COVID vaccine. I think the ideal is far from achievable, but whatever is achievable have been clearly outlined. So we should know what is ideal, what is preferred, and what is critical. Let's have a look at this uh, WHO target uh, for this uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Now, the on, on in the first column, you can see the parameters on which the ideal vaccine has to be uh, evaluated, and then the correct qualities, the preferred and critical qualities in the next column. So the two most important things for any vaccine are the safety and efficacy. So we start with the efficacy. As we say that the preferred efficacy of this should be at least 70% on population basis with consistent results, especially in the elderly. The endpoint may be assessed versus disease, severe disease, and or shedding or transmission of the COVID virus. Uh, critical, if we say, if uh, preferred is not to be achieved, this is the ideal is 70%, but the critical, which is uh, efficacy, is a 50% point estimate. And the endpoint, again, may be assessed versus disease, severe disease, and the most important that successful vaccine should show disease risk reduction of at least 50%. In contraindication, the vaccine should not have any contraindication except that, yes, someone like immunocompromised uh, cannot be given vaccine may be acceptable. All ages should be able to take the vaccine. If not possible, then at least adults and elderly are a must. Lactating pregnant women and children, if they can be included in the vaccine target group, all the good. Adverse effects, there should be no severe adverse effect following immunization of the ideal vaccine and only mild and transient adverse effects are acceptable. 
onset of protection in an outbreak setting there should be a rapid onset of protection so in an onset uh, like uh, the current phase the protection should be available within less than 2 weeks and in the long term then rapid onset of protection becomes less important but as of now we would stick to this uh, preferred criteria of onset within less than 2 weeks number of doses preferred single dose anything given once provides long term immunity is always preferred but if not possible not more than 2 doses that is the maximum that can be we can go up to boosters yes may be permitted but lesser the better and the time of protection preferably should be one year and if not then at least minimum 6 months time of protection has to be there the vaccine should be available in a oral or nasal preferred non parenteral route but uh, if uh, finally if it has to be parenteral then uh, a critical would be that any route may be acceptable if the vaccine is safe and effective so the most important criteria here become safety and efficacy and nothing light if it can be given you know, by a non parenteral route now coming to the product stability and storage the vaccine should uh, be stored uh, should be able to store at higher storage temperature and should be thermostable the in a again in a outbreak setting the shelf life of at least 6 to 12 months is desirable at minus 60 degree and at least 2 weeks stability is desirable at 2 to 8 degree celsius presentation multi dose vial even single vial will do but uh, preferably a multi dose vial especially when it has to be given on a large scale and the most important is that the vaccine should be uh, there should be the ability of scaling up of production at an accessible cost that is the most important thing when we have to produce millions and millions of doses all this is easier said than done uh but there are challenges vaccine will be available but how effective it will be is still not clear reasons number 1 we are still not sure of the critical levels of antibody necessary for protection human challenge study results are not yet available then effect at long term are not available since it's too early into the pandemic uh, adverse effect safety profile will not be known very early but yes we will have some preliminary but the total safety profile will have to wait uh, for a little longer and then still we are not sure about whether viral transmission will reduce as long as this is uh, the data is still not available so to summarize uh, an ideal vaccine candidate has to be highly effective we have defined the efficacy it should be safe with no short and long term adverse effects all ages should be the target group including elderly pregnant women lactating women children should be single shot and preferably not parenteral should provide a long lasting immunity the duration again uh, is a as we said the preferred and critical uh, components uh, characteristics we have already discussed and should, should be easy to store with no stringent temperature requirement and finally the vaccine on uh, when we go into the uh, uh, field mode it has to be scalable it has to be low cost and then uh, this is most important that there have to be global distribution agreements so as to be available to every country and every person who requires a vaccine finally uh, these were my thoughts on an ideal vaccine uh, candidate thank you thank you so much for patient here thank you thank you so much piyush you could stop this slide share uh, i have to say in 5 minutes you gave us a, a fantastic overview of what the ideal wish list is and clearly what we are expecting from a vaccine in record time is is really very hard to achieve uh, thank you so much uh, piyush thank you so much dr nand kumar and we move on to our next talk and uh, it's an honor for me to introduce uh, dr sudhir parik uh, sudhir bhai is a pulmonologist and a, a top expert in allergy in new york uh, he is also the chairman and publisher of parik worldwide media and itv gold channel um dr parik's group has the largest outreach among indian experts globally uh, through his media empire uh, he has been honored with the padam shri the pravasi bhartiya samman the ls island medal of honor and the title of knights of malta um dr parik is the secretary general of gapio over to you sudhir bhai thank you thank you anupam uh, for a nice int introduction uh, really good morning and uh, good evening to everyone all friends it's my uh, proud and uh, 
pride and privilege to introduce uh, Professor Daniel Lucy. But before I introduce uh, Daniel Lucy, I would like, I'm very pleased to announce that uh, my practice, my research institute is a part of the COVID-19 uh, vaccine trial. And we are in the third phase of the trial and uh, we are collecting almost 30,000. I'm the part of the 30,000 uh, <clears throat> uh, volunteers who have participated in this vaccine uh, so far. So let me introduce our distinguished guest, uh, Professor Daniel Lucy, who is a specialized in infectious disease, uh, who works at the Georgetown University, USA. Professor Daniel worked overseas uh, on HIV, SARS, MERS, Ebola, Zika virus, flu, and plague. Based on his vast experience, he proposed the exhibition of, uh, of this viral uh, epidemics at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC, which opened in 2018. We all should congratulate uh, Professor Daniel Lucy to achieve this uh, milestone that having a museum or exhibit at, uh, at this uh, a prestigious uh, museum in Washington, DC. Professor Daniel did his infectious disease training and MPH at Harvard University, served as a consultant in infectious disease at the NIH and worked at FDA on vaccines. Since January 6, he has written over 45 COVID blogs in infectious disease journal and website Let's welcome a distinguished guest, Professor Daniel Lucy. Professor. We can't hear you, Prof. Daniel, if you just unmute yourself. Okay, I think I just did. Uh, yes, you did. Loud oh. and, and nice. And, and, we can and see. I got a slide. Okay. There we go. And you can see the slides okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you very, very much for this great honor to be invited to join such a distinguished uh, international uh, group uh, of of researchers, of, of professors, of physicians, other healthcare professionals. Uh, I think there are several hundred people on the um, webinar right now. Uh, so uh, again, I'm very, very honored. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Rani Pamisabal. And I would uh, like to speak now for only about five minutes. I have only five slides. Um, there's obviously a lot of information. I'd be very happy to participate uh, throughout the 90-minute webinar uh, and during the the question and answer uh, session. So I've been asked to briefly summarize, and I'll do so in one slide each for each of the three uh, COVID vaccine candidates that are now in phase three uh, studies and enrolling uh, persons in the United States. There is a fourth one, but it's uh, still on clinical hold uh, in the United States, although not in uh, Europe or, or South Africa or Brazil. So the three that I want to um, emphasize the, the first is uh, Moderna, uh, which is also uh, collaborating with the U.S. Uh, National Institutes of Health, NIH, uh, particularly the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease, uh, headed up by Dr. Tony Fauci. Uh, so the Moderna vaccine um, has already enrolled 30,000 volunteers, 15,000 of whom receive a placebo, 15,000 receive the vaccine. Uh, the vaccine requires uh, two doses, 28 days apart. Uh, something that Dr. Gupta emphasized in terms of the uh, uh, importance of uh, one dose or at most two doses. Well, the Moderna vaccine requires two doses, one month apart. It's an mRNA vaccine focusing on the uh, S protein. It uh, does not require any adjuvant. Enrollment began uh, the 27th of July of this year, um, and it's been completed in terms of everyone having received the first dose, uh, and now people are receiving uh, their second dose of volunteers in the study. 
it's my, uh, and I emphasize only my anticipated uh, date of late November, the second half of November, um, so a little over a month from now, uh, at which time the Moderna company will most likely, if everything continues to go well without any safety or clinical hold issues arising, uh, that the uh, Moderna will request the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, um, for emergency use authorization, uh, EUA. Emergency use authorization is, in my opinion, the way that COVID vaccines will first be uh, allowed to be given uh, to people in the United States outside of the clinical studies. Subsequently, it will be probably be several months later uh, when any one of these COVID vaccine candidates uh, that receive emergency use authorization from the FDA will eventually receive the tr traditional and full uh, licensure approval. The second of the three vaccines that are in phase three in the United States and enrolling um, volunteers now is one made by uh, Pfizer and, and BioNTech, a company in Germany. Uh, originally, I think there's a partner um, in China, Fosun Pharma, um, but I haven't heard much about them with regard to the trial going on uh, in the United States. Uh, so usually um, it's referred to this vaccine as a Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. As with the Moderna vaccine, there's 30,000 volunteers, half of whom received the vaccine, half of whom received the placebo. But just recently, um, Pfizer requested an increase from 30,000 to 44,000 volunteers and a request to decrease the minimum age from 18 years old to 16 years old. Again, something Dr. Gupta had mentioned in terms of the age range, whether it's the elderly like myself, 65 and older, or, or, or younger, uh, younger than 18, eventually uh, uh, younger than that in terms of the children. Like the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine requires two doses, although not 28 days apart, uh, 21 days apart, so three weeks apart for the Pfizer vaccine. Again, it's an mRNA vaccine, so it doesn't require an adjuvant and focuses on um, uh, spike protein. Our enrollment began the same day for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, and that is 27th of July. My anticipated death date uh, uh, is mid-November uh, uh, when the Pfizer BioNTech will request to the Food and Drug Administration for emergency use authorization. And the third and final uh, phase three vaccine trial that's going on in the United States now in Sterling Rolling um, has just begun recently. It's by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, uh, they plan to enroll 60,000 volunteers worldwide. Um, uh, many, I think at least a half of whom will be in the United States. Um, this is notably a one-dose uh, vaccine. Uh, it's uh, not an mRNA vaccine like the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, but it's a human adenovirus 26 vectored vaccine. Um, enrollment began uh, very recently on the 23rd of September. Uh, my best guess uh, for an anticipated date to request FDA emergency use authorization uh, by the company is uh, somewhere near the end of this year, uh, perhaps in December of 2020. Uh, I guess I'd just like to emphasize one point very briefly, and that is that uh, I think a, a very um, reasonable scientific question is, what are the data to support uh, use of only one dose of this Johnson & Johnson J&J &J vaccine, as opposed to two doses of the Moderna or Pfizer BioNTech a vaccine? What is the uh, evidence for uh, sustained protective immunity after one dose with this vaccine um, in comparison with the two doses of, uh, of other vaccines, such as the Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech vaccine? I'll just leave that as a question. Um, in reading the protocol uh, for the phase three study that has been posted online for all three of these vaccines, uh, and particularly trying to answer the question about why only one dose is needed for the J&J Johnson & Johnson vaccine. In their um, protocol around page 67, 68, um, they state very briefly why one dose is uh, what they chose. 
Um, but uh, I'm, I'm not convinced uh, uh, of the scientific data that was presented in the protocol for uh, one dose being sufficient um, in terms of uh, lasting protective immunity. Again, a very important point that Dr. Gupta emphasized. And my final slide um, just emphasizes some very important news from this week, the 6th of October, where the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, um, made public after approval from the White House, uh, new guidance for emergency use authorization uh, of COVID vaccines. Uh, I put the, uh, the link there uh, so that you can look at it yourself. It's 18 pages, uh, the document that is. It will be discussed um, at a formal open public FDA vaccine advisory meeting on October the 22nd. Um, I believe that's a Thursday, October 22nd. Uh, if you go to the FDA website, you can find the link to uh, register and participate in this open public meeting that I think will be a very important historical event. The topic for the discussion on October 22nd, this FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee, um, uh, is exclusively COVID vaccine candidates. However, there will not be any specific COVID vaccine candidates discussed. There will be more general issues. And I think that this new document from the 6th of October this week on emergency use authorization will be the central discussion point. So I highly recommend that upcoming meeting to you on October 22nd. What I'd like to emphasize that is, in my opinion, the most important new requirement uh, by the FDA uh, for emergency use authorization for candidate COVID vaccines is that a longer period of time to acquire um, safety data. Specifically, it stated that safety data must be reported after a median, not a mean, a median of two months after the last dose of the vaccine in the series. So that would be the second dose for Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, and after the, the one dose for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, also, uh, I think importantly, uh, the FDA guidance from the 6th of October stated that there needs to be at least five um, serious or severe or hospitalized cases of um, COVID-19 in the placebo arm because there's some criticism about, well, what is the vaccine really designed to do uh, if it doesn't prevent severe disease uh, or if there aren't people being exposed to severe disease and developing severe disease in the placebo, then how will we know if the candidate vaccine uh, protects against severe disease? I just want to add without um, getting myself into any um, political trouble here in the United States um, that, um, uh, the, in my opinion, there is a potential for unanticipated events to occur with the uh, Food and Drug Administration uh, with regard to COVID vaccines, as well as other issues um, that you probably are aware of, including monoclonal antibodies and certain drugs and convalescent plasma, et cetera. Um, but it's possible that there would be unanticipated events that might occur with the FDA uh, of a political nature uh, before the uh, U.S. presidential election on November 3rd. I hope not, but I think that it's important to be aware of that possible um, unanticipated occurrence. And finally, I'd just like to emphasize that um, having worked at the FDA uh, and vaccines for three years, um, and following daily, as I'm sure all of you are doing as well, the COVID vaccine uh, unfolding history. Um, it's, it, in the United States, I think it's very important uh, to recognize that if the vaccine companies themselves, Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, and then quite a few others that will be doing studies, phase three studies, I think soon, that if the vaccine companies uh, they must themselves first request emergency use authorization or licensure of their candidate vaccine from the Food and Drug Administration. So why am I emphasizing that as my final point? Because this is very, very crucial in terms of the process of getting FDA authorization for a COVID vaccine. So if the company doesn't request authorization or licensure, for their candidate vaccine from the Food and Drug Administration, 
then the Food and Drug Administration will not act. They will not authorize, they will not license any candidate COVID vaccines or any other vaccines for that matter. So again, I just wanna emphasize that um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether there be approval by the FDA of a vaccine or authorization uh, before the November 3rd uh, presidential election or not. Um, personally, I don't think that that will happen. Um, but if, the, if, uh, if no companies request uh, the FDA to grant emergency authorization um, before November 3rd, then, then there definitely will not be any uh, COVID vaccines uh, authorized by the FDA before that date, November 3rd, or, or any other date. So it's really first up to the companies to make their formal request for authorization or licensure to the FDA, and then the FDA has to uh, evaluate uh, comprehensively the safety and efficacy and immunogenicity data and consult with their vaccine advisory committee of experts um, and, and perhaps with others and reach their decision. So thank you very much for the time and the opportunity to join such a re renowned uh, international uh, group and I'll be glad to answer questions later during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, I think the wealth of experience that you have, the decades of experience and your understanding of vaccinology and, and infectious diseases came out so well in that you presented in four slides what I think most people would have taken 40 slides to do. And thank you so much for the latest uh, update from the FDA. Uh, for all our colleagues who joined from different parts of the world, I've just been told by Dr. Tandon that we now have participants from 23 countries. Um, uh, Daniel, I request you to, yeah, you, you put off the, the slide share. So thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you so much, Sudhir Bhai. We move on to our next talk, and it's a privilege for me to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Anupama, uh, who's a pediatric uh, anesthesiologist at the Children's Hospital of San Antonio, Texas. She's currently the president-elect of the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, will take over as president 2122. Uh, may I invite Anupama to introduce Professor Adam Finn from the United Kingdom. Anupama. Thank you, Anupam, for that uh, kind introduction uh, about myself. Um, I live in Texas, so uh, just uh, a few couple of days ago, I had a message from uh, our Medical County Society to register and enroll for the vaccination. So we already started now. The process is in. The game started, so let's see. Uh, it's a great honor to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Adam Finn. And uh, Dr. Adam Finn is professor of pediatrics at the University of Bristol and an honorary consultant pediatrician at British Bristol Royal Hospital for Children. He is an investigator in the phase one and phase two, three trials of the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine, as well as other trials now starting in the UK. He is a member of the UK NITAG, NITAG called JCVI, Joint Committee for Vaccines and Immunization, and he chairs the WHO Eurotechnical Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization. Uh, we welcome Dr. Adam Finn, and we look forward to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction and for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not seeing on my screen an option. Oh, no, I am. Sorry, I'll just get this slide up. Here we go. Okay, could someone just confirm that you're seeing the slides okay? I see very clearly, Prof. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so my name's Adam Finn. I'm a pediatrician from Bristol in the UK. Uh, at Adam H. Finn is my Twitter handle, and at Bristol Uncover is the Twitter handle of our research group in Bristol, our COVID-related research. I promise I don't tweet about Donald Trump or what I have for breakfast. I only tweet about vaccines. So uh, if you're interested in vaccines, do uh, consider following me. Uh, so uh, yeah, a pleasure to speak to you all this afternoon and uh, at least afternoon in the UK. And uh, I'm just going to give a, a very brief roundup of what's going on with the Oxford vaccine and also one or two other trials in the UK. Okay, how do I make this go forward? There we go. Uh, this is a, um, an animation from the Oxford uh, Vaccine Group website of their vaccine. Uh, this is uh, like the uh, um, vector vaccine that you had just heard uh, Daniel talking about from Janssen. Uh, this, uh, the Oxford uh, adenoviral vector 
uh, is a chimp chimpanzee adenovirus, which means that people receiving the vaccine should not have any antecedent immunity to the, uh, the, the adenovirus, um, uh, which would avoid that being neutralized. Into it has been engineered the uh, DNA for the spike protein of COVID. Uh, there are no antigens from COVID, only the DNA for the spike protein. So people who've uh, had COVID and have immunity, naturally acquired immunity, should not mount any immune response against this vaccine. So adenovirus is a, a DNA vaccine. It, it basically introduces the gene into the human cell, the muscle cell, when it's in, uh, injected intramuscularly, which then expresses the spike protein and, and that in turn induces an immune response. That's the principle behind the use of the vaccine. Uh, this is one panel from a paper published in Lancet a couple of months ago. It's the preliminary results of the phase one trial of this vaccine. Um, and it's, this panel shows some uh, neutralizing antibody titers uh, induced after a prime boost uh, regimen of this vaccine, the, the priming dose given at day zero and the boost at day 28. Uh, so you can see that there is some functional antibody being uh, induced by this, uh, which is comparable to the uh, amounts of measurable neutralizing antibody in patients uh, with PCR confirmed COVID. So uh, potentially protective immune responses, uh, though of course time will tell. Uh, the phase three study, which is uh, details of which can be found at this URL at the top of the slide, is going on in 18 sites across the UK. It began at the end of May um, and is aiming to recruit a total of 12,330 adults, uh, most of them 18 to 55 years old. The uh, recruitment is not quite finished. There are a few hundred more individuals in the 70 plus age bracket still to be recruited. But the majority of these people have actually received not only the priming, but also the boosting dose of the vaccine. Um, the subjects are randomized one to one to receive two doses of the vaccine or as a control, uh, an active control, the quadrivalent meningococcal conjugate vaccine, uh, in order that they do not become unblinded by uh, the absence or presence of local and systemic reactions. Um, the primary endpoint of the study is symptomatic PCR probe in COVID, um, and there are a whole long string of secondary endpoints, as you might expect, including severe disease requiring hospitalization, intensive care ventilation, and death. Um, there's obviously a, a number of safety endpoints, uh, immunology, immuno immune responses, both systemic uh, B cell, T cell, and mucosal are being studied in detail. And I'm glad to say, because I'm a particularly uh, particularly concerned about the ability of these vaccines to interrupt and prevent transmission in the population. This study is looking quite carefully for evidence of uh, not only seroconversion to the N protein, that is serological evidence of asymptomatic infection, but also uh, reduction in viral shedding by active surveillance of the study participants through regular swabbing. This is not something that's being done in by any means all of the studies and uh, something that I think certainly should be being considered. Uh, these are uh, data from today's newspaper, actually, about what's going on in the UK. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, in common with other Europe, Western European countries, we're seeing a very rapid rise in numbers of cases going on at the moment. This is, of course, extremely bad news for the UK in terms of its health and its economy. But it's extremely good news in terms of this study, because what happened uh, was that the uh, original lockdown uh, drove down the incidence of cases to almost zero in the August, um, July, August period, um, when we were expecting to see cases in an end point to the study. And the uh, return of the virus now will uh, enable us, I hope, to achieve an end point in the fairly near future. And as a matter of fact, in my centre in Bristol, we've had two subjects present in the last week who are PCR positive. So given that we need uh, around eight, 15 cases in total for an interim analysis and 30 for the predicted primary endpoint analysis, uh, we may be in a position to see uh, evidence of, or absence of evidence of uh, efficacy in the very near future. Otherwise in the UK, there are a series of trials of other vaccines with over a variety of platforms 
uh, starting at the moment. Uh, one of a, rec a recombinant protein vaccine commercial, commercially funded study is already recruiting. Uh, several are in setup. There's an RNA vaccine that's been developed by Imperial College London that's similar uh, in nature to the first two that uh, Daniel told you about. This is a liposomally enveloped RNA vaccine, which is in phase one. Um, and we also, in addition to additional vector vaccines, additional adjuvanted recombinant protein vaccines uh, have at least one whole inactivated virus vaccine expected to be coming into phase one before the end of this year and into phase two in the early part of next year. Um, we've got a large network of sites being in set up across the UK. Um, uh, and this is quite challenging because we can't just do these studies in the established tertiary university centers. We need to do them right across the country in order to have the uh, capacity to uh, enroll uh, sufficient numbers of subjects to all of these different studies. So that's uh, quite a, a complicated process that's ongoing at the moment. Uh, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Adam Finn. Uh, Anupam? Back to Anupam. Looks like we've lost the boss. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. And thank you so much, Anupama. Uh, really very well put. Gave us a clear understanding of what's happening uh, in the UK. So now that we understand a bit on what's happening in North America and what's happening in uh, the United Kingdom, we're very keen to know what's happening in India. And to tell us um, what's happening with the Indian vaccines, we have uh, Professor Vinod Paul, who really knows ex exactly what's happening in his position. And to introduce uh, uh, Professor Paul, uh, it's an honor for me to introduce Professor Bamra. Professor J.S. Bamra is a senior psychiatrist in Manchester. He's chairman of the British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, BAPIO. He's a board member of the Synergy Collaborative Center. Uh, he is the deputy chairman of the Board of Science of the British Medical Association. Uh, he's served on the Council of the Royal College of Psychiatry and has been honored with many awards, including the CBE from the Queen for his services to mental health, diversity, and the NHS. Over to you, JS. Thank you very much, Anupam, for that very kind introduction. And uh, we've had some cracking talks, haven't we? Amazing stuff going on around the world around COVID. And for GAPU to bring it together, I'm, I'm so grateful. So I'm very grateful, Anupam, as president of GAPU, and also to Sudhir Parikh for the privilege of being here. Greetings from my president, Ramesh Mehta, and all the executive of GAPU as well. So my, it's my pleasure, absolute pleasure, to introduce Professor Vinod Paul, because He's an icon when it comes to anything to do with medicine. Uh, do we are dominated by pediatrics, I see, Anupam, for some reason. So Professor Paul, who does not, not need much introduction, I know, but I will try and introduce him, and I'm not going to do him justice because he's just a huge person. He, is the head of, uh, he was the head of Department of Pediatrics at Ames in Delhi before being appointed as member of Niti Aayog Government of India, Professor Paul has been closely associated with India's health policy and programs in various roles over the last three decades. He is the chairman of the Board of Governors of the Medical Council of India, the governing body that governs doctors, as you will know, and he has played a pivotal role in the formation of Poshan Abhiyan and Ayushman, uh, Ayushman uh, Bharat Initiative. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Vinod Paul. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, greetings from Delhi. Thank you, Anupam, for the opportunity and uh, very pleased to be in the company of such a distinguished gathering. Uh, I'm going to uh, describe briefly where the vaccine journey of India stands as of today. Firstly, I'd like to uh, make the point that we as uh, a country are very proud that we are in the forefront of uh, vaccine for COVID-19. And this uh, privilege comes from two strands of our strengths. Firstly, it is our industry. We supply two thirds of uh, vaccines for children across the world. And this has been there for a long period of time. And not only this industry dishes out 
vaccines, but also develops them. Uh, we have uh, original uh, development of vaccines from, from our industry. But also equally important is the fact that we have a very strong science and technology and R&D ecosystem. We have excellent laboratories uh, of the Indian Council of Medical Research, of the Department of Biotechnology, and our Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, just to name three major agencies who can contribute toward, uh, toward developing vaccines. Uh, one of our laboratories of the DBT is a WHO designated laboratory for, for assays, uh, for worldwide uh, participation in assays for COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccine effort. Uh, from the academia and the laboratories, there are at least three to four vaccine candidates in various stages of our laboratory. I would like you to know that Indian scientists are in their disease chapter of IEP uh, in 2018, and uh, he also was a convener for immunization committee of uh, IEP again in 2005 and 2006. And uh, he uh, is editor of books, and uh, one of his book has been immunization in practice and uh, IEP pediatric infectious disease. And he has contributed to several modules on pediatric infectious diseases. So here is again one of our stalwarts uh, from India, uh, introducing Professor Sham Kukreja. Thank you, Dr. Virendra Sharma. Thanks, Dr. Anupam, to join this, uh, to make me join this prestigious group. And I'm really honored. And I'm now sharing my screen. So, Uh, the data to collect on uh, Chinese vaccine was not easy. So I have spent a lot of time collecting this data. And uh, uh, I'll be uh, describing this in few slides. So uh, there have been something like 35 candidates in clinical trial, these vaccines. Among them, nine are in the phase three. And out of these nine, I've underlined four, they are from China. They are in the phase three. Uh, Okay, their clinical trials started in April. They had three inactivated vaccines. The trials started in April. And one virus is adenovirus vector-based vaccine. The trial started in March. Phase one, phase two trials results, they were unveiled in uh, June, authorized for emergency use of three inactivated vaccines in July. And in June, it was adenovirus vector vaccine, which was authorized for emergency use. There are four vaccines are almost in the final stages of clinical trials. And they are supposed to be available in November, December, or early next year. Now, are there, out of these four vaccines, three are inactivated vaccines. Uh, being uh, uh, developed by Sinovac Biotech, which is a private company, Two are being developed by China National Biotech Group, which is CNBG, also known as Sinopharm. It is state-owned and they are making two inactivated vaccines. And the last one is adenovirus vector-based vaccine that is being manufactured by CanSinobiologic with the Research Institute of Academy of Military Sciences. Okay, the first vaccine, the Sinovac vaccine. This is a... Uh, uh, the vaccine which has been researched most. And in this vaccine, the same uh, timeline, which I've told you earlier, it was available in July 22nd for authorized for emergency use. And uh, this vaccine has gone through phase two trials in 600 healthy adults in the age group of 18 to 59 years. And after this trials, they decided they'll be using low dose that is three microgram vaccine in two doses at an interval of four weeks. And they have done another trial in the age group of 60 to 89, which interests us most. And in this age group, somehow they found the seroconversions were similar to what in the 18 to 59 year age group is there. So seroconversions were comparable and seroconversions were to the tune of 92%. The GMTs of these two groups were comparable. 
Now, more than 24,000 people have been recruited in Brazil, Turkey, Indonesia, and they are planning to have Bangladesh and Chile also, according to the CEO of Sinovac vaccine. Uh, this vaccine got emergency use approval. As a result, many frontline medical workers have received this vaccine in China, and 90% of the Sinovac company staff, which is around 3,000 people, they've also received this vaccine. There are stringent regulation in US, European Union, Japan, Australia, which have historically blocked the sale of Chinese vaccine. But Sinovac plans to break that, and they want to apply for US FDA for this vaccine. The brand is, name is known as CoronaVac. And uh, this vaccine, um, uh, interestingly, uh, is being, uh, uh, trials are being started in the age group of three to 17 years. And uh, this is before the uh, phase three trial results are available. So it appears to be a little unethical to try this vaccine in children without the phase three trials and against the development vaccine playbook rules. But anyway, uh, this is being done there. Now coming to the next two vaccines, these are being uh, manufactured by China National Biotech Group, CNBG also known as Sinopharm. This is state-owned and two vaccines are being made. Uh, this you must have seen in the uh, social media, these two uh, images, which a lot of discussion happening from where these vaccines are and all that. So most possibly these vaccines are available in UAE. They are being used in the uh, healthcare workers. One is the Wuhan Institute Biological Product Vaccine. Again, this CNBG collaboration. And this is a Vero cell inactivated vaccine. Other is from Beijing Institute of Biological Products. This is also Vero cell vaccine inactivated. And these two products are available in UAE. So similar timeline of this vaccine also. And uh, phase one, phase two trials results are available in JAMA. The neutralizing antibodies were there in um, most of the individuals. And they have used this vaccine at an interval of three weeks, two doses. Now this Wuhan Institute uh, uh, vaccine is being launched in uh, uh, UAE, Peru, and Morocco. The phase three trials are going on in 15,000 individuals. Total is something like 48,000 of both the vaccines. And the Beijing vaccine is being uh, 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 tried in UAE, Bahrain, Jordan, and Argentina. On September 14, UAE gave emergency approval of these vaccines for the healthcare workers following successful interim results in phase three. This is our guesswork, and I could not access this data of phase three interim results. Now coming to the fourth vaccine, that is CanSinoBiologic vaccine, that is adenovirus vector-based vaccine, which is being developed with the Research, Research Institute of Academy of Military Sciences. Again, the timeline is one month earlier, but somehow it has lagged later in the phase three and all the four vaccines are likely to be available later this year. And uh, Lancet study has been published for phase two trials. And in this, uh, it has been used in the phase two in uh, uh, more than 18 years, 5,008 subjects. They tried two doses, one in 10 to raise power 11, other was five into 10 raised to power 10 and both the groups were used this uh, different doses and uh, they were assessed for humoral response as well as T cell response and uh, both the groups showed good zero conversion and as well as positive specific T cell responses and this vaccine uh, as early as in August started their phase three in Saudi Arabia the other countries which are using this as in the phase three are Russia, likely to be Pakistan, Brazil, Chile. This is according to Bloomberg report. Uh, China Central Military Commission approved this vaccine since June 25th for a period of one year for use in, in military people. And uh, our concerns are two. One is if you have an adenovirus 5 vaccine, the pre-existing antibodies uh, may not uh, be make the vaccine very efficacious because of uh, Antibodies are already there against this common cold virus. And this vaccine had some issue with development timelines and one dose strategy may not work. An inactivated vaccine, we have experience of dengue vaccine. The worries are 
it may create an antibody dependent enhancement. These are the two issues. And with this, I say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, not easy to get this data. So really appreciate your, your finding the time. And it's a privilege now for us to uh, go to Geneva. And we're going to be joined by <clears throat> Dr. Swamia Swaminathan. Well, uh, uh, Dr. Swaminathan doesn't need any introduction. She's the chief scientist of the WHO. Prior to this appointment, uh, she served as the de uh, WHO's uh, deputy director general for programs. She's a pediatrician with extensive experience uh, as a global researcher in tuberculosis, HIV. She served as a secretary uh, to the government of India for health research and director general of the Indian Council of Medical Research. She earlier served as the coordinator of the UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank, WHO special programs for research and training in tropical diseases. She's uh, published more than 350 papers. Uh, and has been elected as a fellow of the US National Academy of Medicine and fellow of all three academic societies in India. Uh, over to you, uh, Professor Swaminathan. <clears throat> well, um... She was on another program and she was meant to join, but um, as there is a delay, I'm uh, going to take the liberty of asking Professor Ashok Datta to speak on the Russian vaccine because we couldn't get our speaker from the Gamaleya Institute in Moscow. Uh, Professor Datta, if you just uh, shed light on uh, the Russian vaccine and by that time we should have uh, Professor Swaminathan come in. Dr. Datta, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, so coming to the Russian vaccine, this was developed by a Russian institute that is a Gamalia National Research Center of Epidemiology and Microbiology. And they have developed actually two types of vaccine. Again, this is an adenovirus based vaccine. They have developed adenovirus with adenovirus 26 as well as an adenovirus 5. Both these vaccines they have developed and they have two types of formulations which they have developed. One is a frozen form and another is the lyophilized which is a freeze dried form. So these are the vaccines which have been developed by them and they have done a phase one and phase two trials in Russia itself. However, in this, both these trials, they have done taken only very limited number, very small number of cases in both phase one and phase two, 38 case, total 76 cases, 38 in each group they have taken. And that is why they have, this is a small number of cases which they have taken. And following the phase two, which has been published in Lancet a few days back, they have found that the antibody titer is very, very good against the spikes protein. And as well as they have identified that they have, uh, that is CD4 as well as CD8 count with both frozen form as well as in the lyophilized form, they have increased. And based on that, they were trying to even start this vaccine for general use, but there have been hue and cry from the whole scientific, um, you can say scientific people from all over the world that unless and until you do, uh, phase three with large trial, we cannot accept this. And therefore they have now started doing a phase three trial with 40,000 population subjects in this particular trial. And this particular um, vaccine is now known as Sputnik V. They have given the name as Sputnik, the first shuttle, um, space shuttle name after the first space shuttle, Sputnik V. And this particular vaccine has been in collaboration with the government of uh, the, with uh, Dr. Reddy's laboratory in India. They are with the Russian government, which is the Russian Direct Investment Fund. They are doing now in collaboration with Dr. Reddy's laboratory. A protocol has been submitted to our CDSCO and this protocol required some modification 
and initially they wanted to do only a phase three trial, but the CDSCO said that you should do both phase two as well as phase three trial. So now the phase two and phase three trial will be started very soon. And the Russian Development Investment Fund has committed that they will be providing 100 million doses of this vaccine in India. So this is the status of this vaccine. So far we know that this vaccine has worked in both these formulations, but they have used two doses. The first dose they have given and following that the second dose they have given 21 days later. So these are the two doses and after that they have done antibody titer on seventh day, 14th day, 28 days, as well as in 42 days. And they have shown that this after 28 days, the uh, antibody titer as well as cell mediated immunity response has been good. But unless and until a big trial report comes after phase three, we are still will have to wait for this particular vaccine to be introduced, especially in India and any other countries of the world. This is what in short about the Gamelia vaccine. Another Russian vaccine, they are also telling that they are in the phase three, that is a Siberian Institute has developed another vaccine, which is a DNA-based vaccine. This is also a phase two trial has been done and they are going to bring out, uh, do a phase three trial there. So these are the two vaccines which are developed by uh, USSR Russia. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Datta. And while we await uh, Professor Somya joining, we're going to move on to the Q&A. And uh, to handle the Q&A, and the moment we see Dr. Somya come in, we will go on to her uh, remarks, and then we will keep carrying on with the Q&A. So to run the Q&A, we have Professor Ashok Datta, uh, who is an emeritus consultant at Apollo Hospital, Delhi. He's former director, professor, and head of uh, pediatrics at Lady Harding, Kalavati Saran Children's Hospital, and principal of Lady Harding Medical College. Uh, he's the India expert uh, on polio eradication and member of the Indo-US Research Group, 175 publications, uh, has edited several books, including on vaccination, a recipient of the Outstanding Asian Pediatrician Award and the Lifetime Achievement Award by National Neonatology Forum. Uh, Professor Datta is going to be joined by uh, a young uh, and dynamic colleague, Dr. Vinay Devraj, uh, who's an internist and an infectious disease uh, specialist uh, he is the head of infectious disease at Bolo Hospital, um, Bangalore, and runs the adult vaccinology uh, program. Uh, several publications to his credit. I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Datta and Vinay to start the Q&A. And like I said, the moment we have Dr. Soumya, we will go back to Dr. Soumya and then come back to the Q&A. Uh, over to you, please. Thank you. I'm here now, Anupam. Oh, great. Great. Oh, oh. Oh, great. So we will, we will have the privilege of hearing. We do understand that you had another television program going. So thanks ever so much uh, for finding time for us. You know how busy you are. So over to you, uh, Professor Somana. What would you like me to touch on since I've missed most of the discussion? Okay, so let, me, let, 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 let us tell you what, what all we've discussed. So we talked about the ideal candidate, which uh, the guidelines the WHO gave. Uh, we yeah. talked about uh, the three U.S. Uh, vaccines. We talked about uh, where we are with the phase uh, three trials and, and what are the FDA expectations in terms of uh, the new guidelines that they issued on the 6th. Uh, we then uh, went to England and uh, uh, talked about the U.K. and the, uh, I mean, the Oxford and the other U.K. vaccines. Uh, and uh, then... Uh, we discussed the Indian vaccines and Professor Paul uh, gave us an overview of all the Indian uh, candidate vaccines and where we are with those. We then had an overview of the Chinese vaccines, the four Chinese vaccines. And then uh, Professor Datta talked to us about the Russian vaccine. So there we are. Uh, that, has, that is all that we've discussed. So over to you. Um, Thank, yeah, I've unmuted now. Thanks very much. Greetings to everyone and uh, apologies for coming in late. Um, so I can maybe give the viewpoint from the WHO. And we've been doing a number of different things. Starting with the beginning in January, we actually convened a global research forum where we looked not only at vaccines and diagnostics and therapeutics, but also at a number of other areas where obviously being a new virus, there was uh, very little known about it. And so we came out with a, uh, a research roadmap 
with a number of knowledge gaps and research priorities. And then nine different working groups were constituted. They started working on things like epidemiology, on the animal source of the virus and the whole, you know, animal to human jump um, on, and then on clinical management. There's a group that's been very active on that, on infection prevention and control. And then we set up expert groups that started looking at some of the enabling sciences, things like um, standardizing animal models. Again, being a new disease, a new virus, there was no known animal model. So for therapeutics, for vaccines, you need that. Also, we started um, uh, looking at standardizing laboratory assays, neutralizing antibody assays and other kinds of immunological tests. So that was quite a lot of uh, early work that started. And meanwhile, we also put together a group that started looking at uh, designing a vaccine trial. And we came up with the Solidarity Core Protocol that went up on our website in, uh, I believe, in May. At the same time, we had also developed the target product profiles that, that you mentioned, so that developers of vaccines, and there are two kinds of target product profiles. So there's a vaccine that's used essentially as a preventive vaccine, and another one that could be potentially used in an outbreak setting, so as, as a responsive vaccine, and there are two sets of uh, target product profiles. And then we um, started having these uh, talks with developers and, and also maintaining a landscape on our website of all the vaccines in development. And that's updated every week. So we know now that we have about 40 vaccines in clinical trials around the world. And about 10 of those are now in phase, late phase 2B or in phase 3 trials. And the, the, the first two, of course, were the Moderna vaccine and the AstraZeneca both of which started vaccine trials in July. And then shortly thereafter, this was followed by uh, some of the other candidates, including uh, the Pfizer candidate. Um, there, there have been several Chinese candidates that have gone into phase three. Um, and then more recently, the, the Russian, uh, there are two candidate vaccines from Russia. And, and then we have, of course, three trials going on in India that you've heard about. What we are, are looking at is, uh, so we did on the R&D side, we work with the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, CEPI. They are the ones who are actually funding the R&D. They've got nine candidate vaccines in their portfolio and another nine uh, which are in uh, further stages, later stages of development. We work on policy. So we, uh, of course, the WHO has something called the SAGE, the Scientific advisory group of experts uh, on immunization. And this SAGE has been functioning for many years now. They are the ones who do global guidelines for uh, immunization. So they set up a working group on COVID vaccines, which is just reported back to the SAGE. They've come up with two sets of documents. The first one is the values and preferences. That actually explains the principles like equity, justice, reci reciprocity, uh, and both global and national uh, equity as principles for how you would distribute vaccines. Because for us, the development of vaccines is as important as the fair and equitable allocation and distribution of these vaccines. We don't want to see a situation where there are a lot of vaccines, but all going to the rich countries, while all the other countries in the world are waiting in line. So from the very beginning, the uh, access issues and the equitable access was an essential element of our plans. The second document that SAGE has just come out with, I think it will become public in the next couple of days, is a prioritization framework. So it's basically a guide to countries on how they would go about prioritizing within their own countries, populations which should be vaccinated, because we know that in the beginning, there are going to be limited number of vaccines, whether it's the US or the UK, you're not going to have vaccines on day one for the entire population you will get a few tens of millions of doses initially, and this will then get into hundreds of millions of doses. And eventually we will may have billions of doses if many candidate vaccines actually prove to be successful. So the idea is that you have a phased approach, the first phase being those you, who are, will be considered at highest risk in any particular country or society. And everyone seems to agree that healthcare workers would fall into that category, followed by other kinds of frontline workers, followed by those who are 
um, older because we've seen across the world that older people do suffer disproportionately and much have higher mortality rates. Now the definition of older is going to vary. In Japan, older is going to be over 80. In uh, India, it could be over 50 or 55 just because of the demographics of, of the population. So this is for every country to decide because if you are given say 15 million doses at the beginning, who are those 50? And then, you know, most of these vaccines are two dose vaccines. So you have to keep that in mind. You can't just give one dose of the vaccine to 15 million people. That's not going to serve the purpose. So who are those seven and a half million people who will get the vaccine initially? And then subsequently, how do you... So many countries have put in place task forces and committees and have started looking at this. And I've also started looking at uh, supply chains, distribution networks, etc. The third set of activities that WHO focuses on is on the regulatory side. As you know that we have a system of pre-qualification of drugs and vaccines and uh, many low-income countries uh, or majority of countries around the world rely on WHO pre-qualified drugs and vaccines. Uh, countries which have their own, you know, very stringent regulatory authorities do not, but those are only five or six countries. The majority will. So we have already started now. We've opened last week. We put out a call for a rolling submission on emergency use authorization of vaccines. So if I can just spend a minute on that, generally a vaccine or a drug goes to a regulatory authority with a full dossier with data on efficacy and safety and applies for a license. Now in an emergency situation as we are in now in a pandemic or in some other kind of an emergency, I think this was invoked for MDR TB also, where bedaquilin was, like, was authorized to be used even though it had not gone through phase three trials because MDR TB is a disease that kills people. So you could have a situation where regulators would look at data uh, in a, on an interim results. So you would look at efficacy data, and, but you would also look at safety. You cannot uh, bypass safety. Int uh, efficacy data, you can get signals on interim analysis, but uh, safety, you have to have the follow-up. So the FDA has put out clear cut guidelines and so have we. The WHO actually put out the guidelines before the FDA to say this is the basic minimum data that we will be looking for. And we've told developers they can, they can start discussions, they can start sharing whatever data they have. And we will be looking at that and at a point where we are comfortable, there may be an emergency use authorization that's, that's provided. Now national regulators have jurisdiction and authority within their own countries. So a national regulator can always approve anything based on the data that they are seeing for use for their own country, their own citizens. But a WHO authorization or a pre-qualification would enable a global procurement agency like Gavi or UNICEF to actually procure and distribute vaccines to multiple countries. And uh, we're working with, so as I said, we work with CEPI and Gavi and together we have the COVAX facility. Today we have 171 countries in COVAX um, including China, they just announced that they were joining. Uh, this represents over 70% uh, or much higher actually now that China is joining. But probably close to 90% of the world's population is now part of the COVAX facility. And the advantages there are that you get a choice of vaccines. We don't know which of the vaccines is going to be successful. We, we hope that several will be. So th there's a flexibility uh, and a risk pooling in, uh, in investing in many vaccines. And the second thing is that because the procurement will be done on large volumes, you're also likely to get good price, prices on, on these vaccines. And so I think it's, it's good both for the self-financing countries. We have about, um, uh, I forget the exact number now, but uh, close to 80 or 85 self-financing countries, which means that they'll actually pay for the vaccines that they're going to buy and have already started paying in advance to the facility so that the facility can invest in advanced market commitments to companies. And then we will have the Gavi eligible countries. There are 92 countries which will get the vaccine at a very low cost or could be possibly also free. So the Gavi board has now endorsed a decision where 
this, the countries which are eligible for the Gavi support will need to pay somewhere between one and a half to two and a half dollars per dose uh, to, to share the cost of the vaccine. Um, but there may be countries, low income, very low income countries that cannot pay that and they should not be penalized for that. And so we need to raise resources about eight billion dollars to ensure that um, at least 20% of the world's population is vaccinated. So the goal of the COVAX facility is to get 2 billion doses of, the, of vaccines by the end of 2021. And then we will go in 2022, probably hopefully into a situation where there is not so much of supply constraints. But 2021 is going to be a lot of supply constraints. There is going to be politics involved. There's going to be a lot of issues but uh, we are hopeful now because so many countries have come together in COVAX and they have committed to equitable access. So let us hope that we are able to uh, get vaccines out to people in all countries at high risk populations, whether they are just healthcare workers or a small group of people, but uh, not face a situation as we did in the past and the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, that's what we want to avoid. A few countries garnered all the doses of vaccines and all the doses of oseltamivir. And the rest of the world would have had a terrible time if it hadn't been for the fact that the pandemic didn't turn out to be very serious. And then rich countries started giving away you know, the vaccines they had because they had extra stockpiles. But we don't want to repeat that now. It just it won't be right. And that is why now I think all of these efforts in advance to, to make sure that it happens properly. And finally, we have the solidarity trial. So, so WHO actually convened a, a consortium of countries and partners to launch a solidarity vaccine trial, which would actually test multiple candidates head to head against a common placebo group. And that would enable uh, efficient and fast testing of as many candidates as possible. Because ultimately we want the best vaccines to be made available. The first ones may or may not be the best. So I think it's important that we test a good number of vaccines, including those that are coming from India, so that we ultimately have, uh, you know, uh, good quality, safe, efficacious, and affordable vaccines. Thanks. Happy to take questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Swaminathan. Uh, so over to Dr. Datta and Vinay. Of course, there were many questions that were at this that had been asked at the start of this session, but many of them have been answered. So I'd urge you to just focus on stuff that we haven't discussed. We will do this for 12 minutes because I know everyone has to leave. It's been a long session. So over to you, uh, please. Next 12 minutes. Yes. Thank you, Professor. Uh, now let's start rush straight to the questions. I think I'll take the initial three to four questions, summarizing uh, the doubts that have been raised by the audience as well. Uh, Dr. Piyush Gupta summarized uh, the ideal vaccine candidates that the WHO has listed. Uh, my first question is to Dr. Daniel Lucy. Uh, since multiple vaccines uh, have been put out, the FDA usually does not give emergency use authorization unless there's a desperate situation like this one. Are we looking at the ability of vaccine to prevent infection as well? If you look at the WHO criteria, it doesn't look at uh, the ability to prevent the spread of infection. It only looks at zero conversion. So how was the vaccine and the vaccine candidates at US tackling this issue? How does FDA give approval? Uh, if at all, this is not the criteria. So what does Dr. Daniel have to say on this? Thank you very much for the questions. Yes, uh, be very brief. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to emphasize uh, that uh, the US FDA has never granted emergency use authorization for a single new unlicensed vaccine. It's never done that. For, for drugs, for diagnostics, yes, but not for vaccines. So it's really uncharted water in a sense. Um, and with the update from the FDA this week, as I mentioned, October the 6th on, on new guidance, um, they look at both laboratory uh, diagnostics in terms of the documenting the infection, but also, as I mentioned just briefly, uh, about uh, severity of clinical uh, infections. So there needs to be a certain number, perhaps five or more uh, serious infections in the placebo group. Um, uh, but to the best of my knowledge, there's not clear uh, requirements in terms of uh, preventing transmission of the virus itself. Um, uh, particularly uh, asymptomatic infections, but that's still under discussion. It's a very, very important uh, 
uh, issue that has been emphasized, uh, for example, by some leading um, uh, researchers from uh, University of Hong Kong uh, School of Public Health uh, uh, just, just recently. Uh, that is, will these candy vaccines prevent transmission as well as uh, disease? So I, I, again, I just want to emphasize, I, I encourage everyone to, if you can make time on October the 22nd, coming up uh, uh, very soon, about 12 days from now, on Thursday, October 22nd, there'll be a public US FDA all day long open discussion about COVID vaccines and emergency use authorization and criteria. Thank you. Right. Uh, so it's only time. I think with time, we'll get to know whether the vaccines are able to prevent transmission of infection as well. Uh, so the second question is uh, to Professor Adam uh, Finn. Uh, I think following up your work, you seem to suggest if at all the vaccine comes up and comes up for emergency use authorization, we need to prioritize who gets the vaccine first. And you seem to suggest probably the 60 plus ones should be prioritized. But if you look at the demographic data, it is varying in different countries. In India, the bulk of deaths that happened up to about July to September, 60% uh, in the 50 to 69 year age group and 43% in a 30 to 59 year age group. So it's kind of a confusing scenario. So how do you think uh, the vaccine should be prioritized as to what age group gets first? Professor Finn, how do you solve this uh, conundrum? Uh, Vinay, I think uh, Adams had to leave. So um... okay, sir. Okay, I think, uh, can we go back to Dr. Daniel again, if you can take this question, how do you prioritize age-wise? The demographics of uh, the people who are vulnerable in the West is a bit different compared to what is in India. Uh, so how do you think the prioritization should be? What do you think should be the age group which gets prioritized for vaccination? Professor Daniel, if you could take this question as well. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, just briefly, um, in the United States, uh, there's been a, uh, a lot of discussion about this. Uh, 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 at the National Academies um, uh, of Sciences. Uh, also, usually the Centers for Disease Control has an advisory uh, group called the uh, uh, ACIP that uh, gives official advice about uh, prioritization uh, of, of new vaccines. Uh, and certainly the age criteria uh, is, is one that's really still under discussion, whether it's age 60 or age 65 and above. Uh, as another speaker emphasized in Japan, it's over the age of 80. Um, perhaps in India, it's in the 50s. So it's really still under uh, discussion. The US CDC's um, advisory group um, uh, has not formally made their recommendations. Um, again, I think everything is going to be uh, very much accelerated uh, in terms of the uh, prioritization. Uh, on October the 22nd on the uh, FDA uh, uh, Vaccine Advisory Committee discussion date and very soon thereafter uh, on or around the US presidential election date of November 3rd. So it's, the short answer is it's not settled yet, but it's actively being uh, discussed, discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so if I can just extend the same question to Professor Paul and ask him, sir, I mean, once the vaccine gets approved in India as well, so let's hope by the year end or early next year. So how are we planning to do it? Because when Professor Swaminathan, Swaminathan discussed about equitable distribution, one, that countries like us get the vaccine. Second, how are we going to divide it? Will it be a government mandated vaccine protocol or will private players have a say? How will this pan out once vaccine comes to India? If Professor Paul can take this question. Well, essentially, we will invoke the same principles that Dr. Swaminathan highlighted, that first and foremost, it should be uh, protecting the frontline healthcare workers and other people who have an excess risk of contracting infection for a societal cause. The second part of that priority is to aim at reduction in mortality. These are now generally accepted universal principles. That the second priority bandwidth is to, to, to reduce mortality. And uh, mortality we know occurs uh, in a higher proportion uh, in, at, in old age. So age criteria would be an important consideration. We also know that mortality occurs in those individuals who have serious comorbidities, chronic diseases of a severe nature, and that has to be accounted for. So first bandwidth of, uh, of uh, scale up of the vaccine would address those who are protecting the health system, protecting the society, and then immediately alongside 
are the, the priorities that are linked to reduction in mortality. And then, of course, uh, there are other considerations in terms of creating a herd immunity someday. If you believe the vaccines are capable of doing it, we will, of course, uh, invoke the principles of equity. We will invoke the principles of uh, uh, access to people where affordability is not going to be an issue. Based on these principles, the government will take the decision the pathways and frameworks for those decisions are being discussed uh, and multiple scenarios are being envisaged wherein maybe there's a limited supply, maybe there's a little more supply. So all that is work, is work in motion and uh, at the right time, this will be uh, disseminated. Thank you. If I might ask uh, Professor Paul, because there are a lot of uh, doctors who work in the private sector on this uh, CME. So do you visualize that it will be through the government machinery that the vaccine will be administered or you would like you did for treatment and for diagnostic? This was a beautiful example of the public and the private sector coming together. Uh, how do you visualize that? Well, let me first say that when I, when I said healthcare workers, it will include the private sector healthcare workers. There, that part uh, uh, is already uh, a high principle uh, when the insurance was offered for healthcare workers as a part of the prime minister's uh, initiative. So, but other issues, whether we should invoke a private market or it should be only through government channels, we have to wait for, 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 for a while because there are so many uncertainties at this point in time, but let the time come. What we will do would be in the best interest of the people of India and in the larger interest. By the way, India is also committed to ensure that part of our stockpile is, is available to other nations and we will work with the COVAX and we will work with our um, uh, other countries uh, uh, for that work as well. And we are also interested that uh, trials of Indian vaccine should also be conducted in other countries, particularly in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question will be to Dr. Datta himself, then he can take over the questions. So do you think uh, that um, this is an audience question? Do you think that we need to confirm uh, COVID uh, presence uh, through RT-PCR before we vaccinate any of these individuals? And do you think in such case where we do not test, vaccination can potentiate the infection and end up causing disease? What are your thoughts on that? And then you take over the question and answer session. Okay. I don't think it will be possible to do RT-PCR in each and every case for giving vaccination for a mass vaccination program. And it is, I do not think that it will be required right now. And uh, especially if you are giving an inactivated vaccine or most of these vaccines are not live attenuated so far, whatever we are doing, uh, whatever is being tried. I don't think there would be any problem. So you can safely give without doing an RT-PCR test. There has been another question from the audience. What is the temperature of the Russian vaccine? Now the Russian vaccine, Gamalia Institute has got two types of vaccine as I've already told you. One is the frozen and another is uh, freeze dried that is lyophilized. The frozen vaccine needs to be kept at minus 18 degrees centigrade. Whereas the lyophilized, you can keep it very easily between two to eight degrees centigrade. There is another question which has been asked by Dr. Anupama. What were the serious side effects from the phase three trial, all the current vaccines? Actually in this, uh, there was a serious side effects which was observed with the Oxford vaccine for which the trial was stopped for certain period of time, including in India also. And that was the GB syndrome, Gulenbari syndrome, which was uh, seen in one of the case. Ultimately, it was found to be not associated directly with the vaccine. So it was not vaccine related. On this issue, I'll like to ask any other panelist if they have observed, and especially Daniel, if you have observed any other serious side effects in this particular vaccine. Daniel, please. Again, thank you very much for the chance to briefly respond. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, there haven't been any um, serious adverse events with any of the three um, studies in the United States that are still enrolling uh, that, I, that I mentioned. Uh, the, the Moderna um, 
the Pfizer or the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccines. But in the United States, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine phase three trial, which did begin, but after approximately one week or eight days, it was put on clinical hold and it still is on clinical hold. So there's no more enrollment. Uh, the few people that got the first dose have not received the second dose. Uh, and the USA in this sense is a, a different uh, than, 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 than Europe and I believe uh, Brazil and India and elsewhere where the AstraZeneca vaccine has come off of clinical hold. I think in the United States, there's concern about uh, uh, apparently a total of two people that have uh, experienced uh, uh, neurological um, adverse events. Um, so I've, I've heard rumors that the, co the clinical hold will come off soon in the United States, but until it does, I, I, I think we just have to wait and see. But otherwise, with the other three vaccines that I mentioned in my presentation briefly, uh, there haven't been any uh, known or reported um, serious adverse events. Thank Back you, to Daniel. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I got a question for Somia. Dr. Somia, there is a question for you. What is the WHO stand now for safety data, whether it is for six months or for two months? Can you hear, Somia? Yes. Yeah. So, yes, this is a question that. Uh, yeah. This is something that uh, we've been uh, discussing internally, and I know that the FDA and uh, European Medicines Agency and other regulators are also thinking about this. We believe that it has to be for at least two months after the last person has received the last dose of the vaccine in the clinical trial, in the phase three trial. So that means that the follow-up needs to go beyond when an interim analysis may be done and initial efficacy data may be presented. Because, you know, if you accumulate a lot of endpoints, you could actually start getting some efficacy signals before you have even completed the enrollment or the follow-up. So I think this ensures two months from the last person having got the last, second dose of the vaccine will ensure this. And that itself is a very short period. I mean, ideally, we would look for six months. But again, because this is an emergency, and as uh, was mentioned earlier, WHO has also never done an emergency use authorization for any vaccine. The novel polio virus, uh, NOPV vaccine, may be the first one, actually. And then the COVID vaccines may follow. But it all depends on, on what the committees feel and how confident they are when they look at the data. And we do work closely with uh, the regulatory agencies, with the ICMRA, which is the International uh, Coalition of Medical Regulatory Agencies. So I think that their thinking is quite harmonized across. So I might just ask, and maybe uh, Dr. Dutta, with your permission, and maybe uh, yes. Professor Swami Nathan or Professor Paul could answer that. Um, the, there's virtually no data. I mean, there, there isn't any work happening in pediatrics at this point in, term, in terms of trials. Now, a lot of questions that parents come up with, and in fact, there's been a lot of speculation that perhaps schools, going back to schools, and all should be linked to vaccination, which of course is not going to happen because there is going to be no vaccine, so the kids will lose a year if we actually look at physical going back. How, how is it that the approval is going to come for the pediatric vaccines? Because if we are going to have, wait for data and phase three for pediatrics, then we're really looking at end of next year, after all the adult work finishes. So if both of you could comment, please. Well, uh you know, we know that uh, children uh, are exposed to infection and they get infection. The, the second zero survey of ICMR and also daily zero surveys show that children are equally prone. And of course, these are 10 years and above. We don't have data below 10 years. So they get the infection. But when you see clinically evident infection and serious infection, there is very little and mortality is negligible. So the public health prudence would, uh, uh, would lead us to, to consider the fact that children need to be humanized, uh, if at all, at a much later stage. They cannot fit into a high priority and they may not really be needing any immunization. So this can wait. Definitely, we need to immunize the teachers. We need to, you know, because they will come in contact with the with the children who would spread the infection and of course they themselves can spread infection. 
So the, here the public health paradigm has to be applied. Mind should be kept open. And in any case, when you have a new drug or a vaccine, uh, you do keep in mind the fact that once you so demonstrate safety in adults and efficacy in adults, only then you come down toward the lower ages. So those principles will be kept. Tommy can elaborate on this. Tommy, what do you like? I think Dr. Paul is. He said everything. I don't have to add anything. I think that was a perfect explanation. Okay. Now, I have a very basic question to Dr. Somia. Originally, this, can you hear me, Somia? Yes, sir. yes. The, the original strain which was found in Wuhan was of a D strain. Now, many of this world now especially 85% of the strain now it has changed from D strain to now G strain. All the vaccines which are being manufactured is with the previous strain of just D strain. Would there be any effect on this development of the vaccine with this new strain, with the old strain? Yeah, I mean, this is obviously a fear that people have that if the virus mutates, then what's going to happen to the vaccines? As you know, as you mentioned, that the first set of vaccines are all uh, basically working on the uh, the spike protein. Yes. You know, they are, yes. the epitope is all of them the spike protein. So if there is a significant mutation in the spike protein, especially in the receptor binding domain, this could affect the vaccine, but it would also affect the virus you know, it may or may not then be able to bind so efficiently. So the mutations are being tracked. So far, there are over 130,000 whole genome sequences in the GISAID database. Plenty of mutations. And as you know, several different clades or strains have been now identified. And there are a couple of mutations that are being tracked by scientists because either they may are associated with increased transmission or, or they could have an implication for drug or vaccine. But so far, nothing that's uh, very concerning. But the good thing is that there's another uh, lot of vaccines that are using some of the other proteins of the COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2. So there is uh, in development uh, as a backup vaccines against some of the other proteins. And, and the other thing, of course, we don't know is the duration of immunity that needs to be studied and that we will know only as time goes on. And whether like influenza vaccine, whether we will actually need to redesign, but you know, the pace of mutations of this virus is much, much less than influenza. So it does seem to be a much more stable virus in that sense. And most of the mutations have been minor mutations, which have not had a big impact on uh, the structural part of the spike protein. There is the last two questions, please. Last two questions. Actually, there is another question for Dr. Somia only. Was the interim analysis done for Chinese vaccine, which was given emergency use authorization? By, and if so, what was the result? Is there any data available which regularized, reviewed this interim data before authorization? So the authorization was done by the, by the Chinese regulatory authority. So, you know, we don't have, uh, we have not seen all of that data, but they have published um, both CanSino and Sinovac have, uh, and I think the Wuhan one also, they have been publishing actually in the scientific journals. So there is data available on phase one and phase two, but we have not seen the submissions that they've made to the Chinese regulatory authorities on, on the basis of which the emergency use was granted. And that's, uh, you know, it's only happening within China. Similarly, the Russian vaccine has been granted emergency use within Russia. So now what we are asking all of these developers is to start sending us that data as well uh, as, they, as they complete phase two and then accumulate phase three data so that we will be also able to assess and, and, uh, and then make a recommendation on either emergency use or um, ultimately pre-qualification is what we would uh, aim for. But that's going to take a little more time. Okay. Now, last question, I would just like to ask one more question. And what about the view of repurposed vaccine? So far, the other vaccine has not come so far. So what is the, is there any use of giving repurposed vaccine? 
So I think we're talking here about live vaccines. Live MMR vaccine, vaccine, OPV vaccine, BCG vaccine. MMR. MMR, BCG, exactly. OPV. Yeah. These are the vaccines which have been shown to be benefiting. Well, they, they are supposed to stimulate the innate immune responses. That's right. Innate immunity. And so it was presumed or hypothesized that these would provide uh, some uh, protection. But um, as of now, there's no evidence. So there are trials going on with uh, BCG as well as with uh, MMR, I think. Um, and we have to wait and see. We have to wait and see because the childhood BCG vaccination, which we give in India at birth, we cannot expect that to be protecting people after 15, 20, 40 years, you know. That's but whether a dose of BCG will protect someone or will increase the protection for a certain length of time just by stimulating innate immunity. Because, and this came from studies which showed that after BCG vaccination, the incidence of sepsis in, in, uh, due to other causes in, in children was, was reduced. And, and that therefore it was hypothesized. But as of now, there's no evidence at all. And we can't do, go by this kind of uh, historical things like uh, because uh, BCG is used in India, mortality is low in India and therefore the two are related. I think that there's no logic there. So we have to wait for the randomized trials. Thank you, Sumya. The trial, uh, Dr. Dutta, the trial on BCG uh, in India is complete in terms of enrollment. The results uh, will be available uh, after a follow-up and the deadline is January. So in January, we would know uh, the BCG trial results, uh, the study that has been done in India, and it's complete now. Okay, thank you, Vinod, for this thank information. You. There thank is you. another question. Another question was there. Last one. Last it, one, please. It was from the chat box, I can see. Measuring IgM and IgG levels testing is necessary before consideration of vaccination? The answer is no. So with that, I thank all the panelists for their excellent contribution and I thank Anupam for giving me a chance to be a member in this panel for asking questions. Thank you. Well, thanks ever so much. This has been fascinating. We had uh, our colleagues from 25 countries. A big thank you to Dr. Soumya, to Dr. Paul, uh, to Daniel, to Adam, to Sham, to uh, Dr. Tata, to Vinay, Satosh, Piyush, um, Dr. Jairam, Sudhir Bhai, Anupama, Dr. Bamra, Virinder, Bhupinder, Bhavna, who put this all together. And I think it's very symbolic that as we wait for the vaccine and we hope for better treatment, we have to re-emphasize uh, social distancing and uh, hand washing. And Daniel, I couldn't help but notice that you put on the mask to remind us. That, and Dr. Paul's done that as well. So as we leave, we have to remember that masks are here to stay. Thank you so much for joining and look forward to hosting the next session on the 31st, where we're going to be talking about patient safety with experts uh, from across the globe. Thank you very much. Good night. Good afternoon. Have a lovely weekend.